I said this to you earlier, for those of you who are here, uh, when we talk about current trends and challenges in digital advertising, it's so important to have your finger on that pulse, which is why we've got this next speaker. He's our keynote speaker, Florian Heinemann, uh, co-founder, managing director of Project A Ventures. He's responsible for the areas of marketing, CRM, and business intelligence, an investor, business angel, in more than 40 startups. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Florian Heinemann. Cool. Great. Thanks. So, yeah, can you hear me? Cool. So thanks uh, for, for hosting me or listening to me for the next, do I still have 30 minutes or should I try to make it a little shorter? So um, basically what I wanted to talk about, and I think that's important or relevant to everybody that's engaging in digital marketing, which could be B2C startups, obviously, that do digital marketing, but also agencies that try to sell stuff in the digital marketing space, but also publishers or content owners that try to make money out of digital advertising. Because all of those um, are currently underlying developments and trends that are quite heavy, heavily affecting uh, the field of what they do. And I think if you look at, um, if you look at what's currently happening in this space, it's probably the most kind of, I mean, disruption is always a big word, but it's probably the most changing or challenging kind of environment since the introduction of Google AdWords, which was kind of a, a mega kind of uh, shift in 2001 or two when it was introduced. Um, and I mean, there was some search-based advertising before. The older ones probably rec still, still remember well, well, things like GoTo uh, and, and .com and, and Overture. That was like 99, but they weren't so prominent compared to Google AdWords, obviously. And what you see right now in digital advertising, that there's other developments that are, will heavily affect what's currently happening. And what I'll try to do is give you kind of a helicopter view um, of things that are happening or the current trends that are underlying and what are the challenges uh, when you are active mainly as a performance advertiser because that's like my main field of expertise uh, if you are a performance advertiser what, what do these underlying trends mean for you as an advertiser and I think that's uh, very important to understand how you can position yourself one thing that's probably relevant to understand before I start is that most of these trends are Extra, like very much being felt in the US first, yeah? And then they move to the UK, then probably Germany, and they're definitely a little bit slower when you come to like Eastern European countries or Russia or Turkey, but they will definitely uh, uh, develop also here to the same kind of extent. The only question is whether a market like China will kind of move out of the way, uh, because it's like always a special case. But I think in every other market, um, all of these trends are relevant, and I think on an abstract side of things, also in China, you will probably see that. One of the weakest sides of my speeches is always my slides, so don't be very irritated by the slides. At least I have slides, so I mean, Ola didn't have slides at all, he was just speaking freely. But for me, the slides is more kind of an orientation list with bullet points, so you'll see. So don't expect anything fancy. So, I told you. So what are the key underlying developments that I see right now, and what do they mean for you as somebody active in that field? I think the most relevant um, shift that you will see right now is that traditionally, media was bought based on context. Yeah? So you bought a magazine placement, you bought a TV placement based on the context where you thought the context is appropriate for your media to be displayed there. That was like the original thinking. But why was that? Because the context that you bought media in was very much associated with a certain target group that you wanted to reach, right? So, but what's happening right now in digital advertising, you have a massive shift towards the actual user that you want to target. So moving away from buying context to actually buying users. Why is that? Because a lot of the media that you're buying right now, that's Google in the first place, but also a lot of the display stuff that, that you can buy, and video, you actually know who's sitting in front of it, and the technical ability, which is called the real-time advertising, or the technological infrastructure, which is called real-time advertising, allows you basically to say, I don't care in what kind of context I'm doing advertising, as long as I know the user. The most prominent, uh, kind of exp expression of this kind of technological shift is retargeting. So if you're visiting some kind of website, you'll be followed 
buy a certain product you've just watched on their website or just looked at on their website. That's retargeting. And retargeting is kind of the simplest kind of expression of what's happening here. So, and that is what's going to happen in the future more and more. And that will be a big problem for people that own contexts because as a magazine, you own a context. But the context, if it loses relevance in terms of the signal where you do your media, rather than the user, the content owners or the owners of context, so the media houses, lose relevance in that space or they lose power in that space. Because if originally you were like the only channel towards the user, um, and you were the only proxy where keep people could actually buy media, f uh, buy media to, and now this is shifting away towards other people that actually have the data to exactly determine what kind of users are there, the context owners are not relevant anymore. And where do you see that? And I think that's, that is something, um, uh, that's the, the, the third point. That's happening right now in the digital advertising environment to a very strong extent, that you basically have four ecosystems, that's Google, Facebook, Amazon, and probably potentially also Apple. Apple right now is not using it to that extent, but Apple will have the data that has user level data to a completely different depth than any context owner. And if you are a publishing house or a context or a content owner, that's a pretty shitty situation because a Google or a Facebook or an Apple or an Amazon will actually be much better in targeting a specific user than any media house is, right? And everybody was laughing about Google AdSense appearing in 2003 and 2004, so the Google-based display network. But now nobody's laughing about it anymore. I mean, basically, Google AdSense in most countries outside of China by today has been has become the biggest publisher of digital media in every, basically every market. And now Facebook has launched exactly the same type of product. They just launched it two weeks ago, where they basically say, if you want to target users based on Facebook data, you can not only do that anymore within Facebook, but you can actually do it outside of Facebook, but based on Facebook data and Facebook information. So what does it mean for you as a publisher or as a content owner? That basically means them, if Google knows a lot more about a specific user of Facebook than me, and they're actually displaying advertising for these users in a much more targeted way than I can do that. You ha really have to think about what's your justification of existence, because that a Berta or a Prozim Sat 1 will be able to sell media directly in a digital space and earning more money than a Google or Facebook, that probably still is the case, but in two, three, four, five years, that's definitely not going to be the case anymore. And what does it mean for you as an advertiser? And I think it's very important to understand. If you have four large ecosystems, Google, Facebook, Apple, and Amazon, where you can buy your media, that's a very different situation from today because today it's enough as a performance advertiser to be a little cleverer than your competitors in buying media in certain niche markets or niche, uh, niche contexts and basically get a better price. Yeah? So the main thing when, we were, when I was still working at Rocket Internet, why Rocket Internet was better than the competitors in like 2007 to 2009 was we were a little cleverer in buying media from small sites at a better price. And all of these abilities to just buy media uh, in, in niches and in kind of using market in transparency will go away. Because if you have four ecosystems where basically, and I think these estimations are probably right, um, most of the large media agencies worldwide think that like by 2020, probably 80 to 90% of all digital media will be traded somehow across these four big networks. And if that really happens, what does it mean for you as an advertiser? There's basically a lot less intransparency in the market. So if you want to compete there, it's not so much about buying a little cleverer, but you actually have to think about other ways to differentiate yourself. And I think that's the main message. If you look at it today, most people think it's enough if I'm doing SEA, so Google AdWords or Bing or Yandex, if I'm doing that a little cleverer than others, that's actually enough to be um, competitive in the market. And that will go away because everybody else, all, ad all other advertisers will be able to compete with you on equal terms. And the interesting thing here is that Facebook, Google, Apple, and Amazon, and especially Facebook and Google, are pushing that very, very hard. I mean, Google and Facebook are, and I think that's very important to understand, the front runners of 
democratization of media buying. Yeah? Because a group M and all of these guys, they benefited for 30, 40, 50 years from the fact that me, Florian Heinemann, have much less favorable conditions to buy media than the big media agencies have. And today, Florian Heinemann can buy with a credit card and five euros, can buy Google AdWords at pretty much the same terms as a Zalando can. Yeah? I mean, Zalando gets support from Google, but they don't get a better price. They might get better payment terms, but they don't negotiate on price. And the same thing happens with Facebook. So what does it mean for you as an agency? And I think that's very important also to, to understand. If you want to run a media business in that space, just buying, getting better prices or just getting somehow trading media will not be enough for you anymore in this world to, to, to be uh, on top of things. And that's actually a big threat to all media agencies because Google and Facebook, they're still supporting media agencies because they need them to do sales and account management for them, especially in countries outside the US and Germany or outside the US and UK. But the long-term role or the long-term power position of a media agency will definitely go down in that space. And I think if you plan to do a media business here or a media trading business in that space, that's very important to understand. You have to have some kind of extra capability that will allow you to be competitive in that space. So, and I think a very good picture to have in mind what's actually happening here is, it basically follows the same path as has happened with the stock exchanges. I remember when I was like in, in, uh, still in um, elementary school or like early high school, Germany still had like 11 or 12 relevant stock exchanges. 11 or 12, and there were people standing there actually shouting at each other. If you saw like Wolf of Wall Street, this is kind of, you know, so, and kind of handing kind of uh, um, little uh, tickets to each other, buying and trading stock. If you now look at the, f I mean, now Germany has only one relevant stock exchange left, that's Frankfurt. And even there, the question is whether Frankfurt will be competitive against a New York and London kind of conglomerate of stock exchanges. So, and exactly the same thing will happen here. First of all, and there's no people anymore at the stock exchanges. So Frankfurt Stock Exchange, there's only a few people sitting there, but you don't hear any shouting or whatever. And the same thing is happening here. So all personalized media trading will go away because it's completely inefficient. Right now, if you book media, it's still often by fax or by email. All of this will be automated. And the, and the frustrating thing, and I think that's also very important to understand, if you have a stock exchange, like Frankfurt Stock Exchange or London Stock Exchange, they are a neutral infrastructure provider for others to trade on. Yeah? In our case here in digital media, the infrastructure providers, so Google and Facebook and Apple and Amazon, they are not only providers of infrastructure where you bid on, but they're also big holders of inventory themselves. Yeah? So what does it mean? It's basically that would be as if New York Stock Exchange would not only provide the platform, but at the same time would be the biggest offerer of stocks and other financial pro products on the platform itself. So that's, in fact, absolutely crazy. So if you want to compete here on this kind of environment, I think it's very important to understand that this is where things are heading. So, and the question is, how can you compete here, whether you are a publisher, whether you're an advertiser, or whether you're an advertising agency? And I think, again, it helps to look at how are people competing in today's financial markets? So who's actually participating in this kind of media trading and how are they doing it? And if you look at the big uh, banks like Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, et cetera, that are participating in this trading, what they've done, they've built up a lot of modeling and, and data science knowledge to be actually be able to compete because there's no more intransparency in the market. So you, you have to create the intransparency yourself in order to have a DSP, uh, to have a USP, a, a competitive advantage in the future. So, and that USP is not derived by intransparency, but it's actually derived by your own modeling capability. So what does it mean for us as a startup or as an investor in startups? What we try to instill very early in whatever startup that we invest in is modeling capability and the, the handling of data when it comes to buying customers and customer retention. So what we try to do to make that very concrete we try to have a data warehouse in place at whatever startup we invest in within the first 10 to 12 months of their existence. Yeah? Because we believe that the ability to interpret the data on media trading in a superior way to your competitors, 
That will be the key differentiator in doing this kind of thing or uh, competing in this kind of world. Because if there's just four ecosystems left, there's very much transparency. The only way to differentiate yourself is by being able to interpret data in a better way. And I'm not talking about big data, because big data is often a very big word, and people are very much talking about big data. This is not about big data. This is talking about, because big data is defined as lots of data, but also unstructured data, like weather data or whatever. Most companies that we invest in, but in fact also most big businesses that we see and cooperate with, they don't have a big data problem. I mean, they also have a big data problem, but in the, in the beginning, they have a problem handling their structured data. That's like the main elementary kind of problem in the first place. And all of this data and media trading, or lots of it, will be very structured. It will be available, it will be structured, so you can interpret it. It's no big data game, it's really just about being able to gather, analyze uh, uh, the data in the best possible way, but you don't have to be a big data expert to do that. You just have to be able to build an infrastructure that handles data and that allows you to interpret it in a, in a more automated way than, than others. And I think that's the main capability in, in digital marketing in the future. And if you look at the big media agencies today and their modeling capability, yeah, they don't have a very bright future if they don't change this right away. And also for a startup, the question is, can you compete against a modeling capability of an Amazon, the modeling capability of a Zalando, et cetera? And I think that's really the big, the big thing that we try to tell our startups very early in the process. If you're not able to build yourself a niche in this kind of environment, it's probably not the most optimal time to be in that space. And another thing that's very important, I think there's also lots of tech tools and advertising technology tools here in the Ukraine and also in other Eastern European countries. What's very important is um, one thing that you'll see more and more, that's the removal of the cookie as the single identifier. Yeah? And what can you do there? Because if you look at it, who doesn't care about cookies in the market? as the main identifier. It's basically Google, Facebook, Amazon, and Apple because they have the login of the user on their device, right? So they don't need cookies. All other tools, and most of the tools that we see here, but also in other places, are very much relying on cookies in order to identify users. And that will be a very problematic thing because all the big players like Facebook, Amazon, Google, and Amazon, they're getting, trying to get rid of cookies as a single identifier because it improves their power position. And personally, or as Project A, we try not to invest into models anymore, advertising technology models, that are too heavily relying on the existence of cookies. Because we believe that the lifespan of cookies as the main identifier is probably limited, and we wouldn't bet on business models that are very much relying on this. And to put that very clear, I actually think that's wrong. Yeah? The only reason why Facebook and Amazon and, and, and Google are pushing so much for it is because they don't care about cookies. From a data privacy standpoint, that's often brought forward to basically say, if you remove cookies, then that's actually better for the users. That's complete bullshit. I think there's hardly any identifier for users that gives them more control over their privacy than cookies. Yeah? So the only argument to get rid of that is not a privacy argument. The only argument is to make American-based companies more powerful in this, in this space. Because if you think about it, nobody else is able to work without some kind of identifier uh, in, in, in a broader extent. And I think that's, but it's very important to, to understand this. Um, if, if you're relying on cookies, you'll definitely have a problem. Um, so the question is, and I, I put that, the nightmare for publishers. What should you do as a media house in this kind of, in this kind of environment? And then what I usually recommend to people that are content owners or want to run a content business is really thinking about how can you build proprietary data pools that are not in the reach or that are not in the, in, in the, in the sphere of a Google or Facebook. That's your only chance, because that you will beat Google and Facebook on socio-demographic and interest data, that's completely unrealistic. That's not going to happen. The only chance that you have as a, as a media company is basically building some kind of proprietary data pool and competence to basically 
uh, go beyond what Google and Facebook are able to do automatically. So media houses should definitely invest in the competence to tell stories to users, to, to think about what kind of sequence do I show to users in terms of, of digital marketing. And I think that's a big kind of thing what I also wanted to say in, in the, um, in the, um, uh, with, the, with the first point, a big chance to differentiate yourself in this space is really to understand the customer journey of users, because there we still have a very limited understanding. What a lot of US companies and also companies in UK and Germany have started a few years ago is tracking customer journeys. So understanding that users see a certain thing first, and then they see a different message, and then they see this, and then they see, see this, and then they convert. So the understanding of that there is such thing as a customer journey, that's already pretty much across, uh, that, 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 that has crossed uh, a lot, um, across a, long, a lot of companies already. But what's very limited is, how can you actually design the customer journey? And I think that's a big chance for startups to think about what's your typical customer journey that you see. What do customers go through? before they actually do a transaction on your platform, before they buy something. And that's also the same case in B2B. Yeah, it's probably less so, but same case in B2B. And trying to understand how you can actually design or manage this customer journey. Because that is something that's very business specific, that's very vertical specific, that's very country specific. So that is a chance where you can actually differentiate yourself against a Google or a Facebook, because it's very, very hard to automize for them. So designing and managing actively the customer journey and not just tracking it, one major, major thing. And another thing that we think is, is absolutely key, I mean, in 2007, when at Rocket we started businesses, it was basically enough to say, okay, we do very aggressive SEO, so search engine optimization, and that hopefully brought businesses to viability within a year or two. Because if you have enough share of SEO traffic that's really cheap, that was basically enough to get things going. But now, with Google being a lot smarter, you cannot do that anymore. So it's unrealistic on competitive kind of terms in competitive time of market to be very competitive in SEO very quickly. So what you need to do now, and that, that is what we are very heavily investing in, and that is also one advice that I can just share, focus a lot earlier than most startups do on CRM, so existing customers, customer relationship management. I call that CRM is the new SEO. That's like my message in the sense that in order to get businesses profitable, the only way is retaining your customers. And I think who's, who's again, I mean, that's not really a startup, but again, a very good role model to look at. If you look at Amazon, although Amazon is growing incredibly aggressive, I mean, if you look at the growth rate in absolute terms, it's still the absolute numbers. I mean, growth rate is impressive, and the absolute numbers behind it even more because the base is already so big. They're growing, and despite that, they have a 3.5% marketing cost ratio. Yeah, 3.5%. If you look at all other retailers out there, like Alibaba is an exception, but if you look at all other retailers out there, you'll find hardly any retailer that's below 10% marketing cost ratio of revenue. Amazon, 3.5%. So, and what is basically the whole thing behind it? And I think that's just something that, that startups should focus on a lot more and a lot earlier, because that same thing at Rocket or at Project A, when we start businesses, we thought, okay, let's grow the customer base for two years, and then we worry about the existing customers. And I think that needs to shift. You need to think about your existing customers and how to, how to target them and how to segment them basically right after you start, because that's the only way you can get the marketing costs down sooner or later. And I think Amazon, with their individualized kind of um, um, uh, CRM, is the best example you can see. And, uh, and that's also the cool thing about the new platforms emerging in the way that they do, because I don't know if you guys are already actively using Facebook custom audience. Uh, that is probably the coolest uh, digital kind of advertising invention that happened during the last two years. That Facebook allows you not only to target new users, but actually allows you or gives you a different channel to interact with existing users. And custom audience is probably the most powerful thing that, that I've seen. Uh, and Facebook is very heavily working on it. And I think very closely looking at what Facebook's doing there currently is a lot more exciting than what Google is doing. So, and people are often arguing, oh, is Facebook losing the reach? Are the young people switching to whatever? I would argue it doesn't really matter because whatever will happen, Facebook will just buy the people 
that are getting competitive to them, so they still are able to have a pretty fre frequent login frequency of whatever users. And if they're willing to, to spend something like $19 billion on WhatsApp, they will, they will just buy whatever comes dangerous to them. So Facebook is definitely there to stay, and I think using their kind of interaction ability to interact with existing customers will be very powerful. So CRM is the new SEO. What are other challenges that, that you should look at? We talked about the actively shaping the customer journey already. What is other stuff that I really want to want to point out? I think one key thing, and that's that's this point down here. What I can only urge every startup, if they want to be competitive in that space, to do is have some kind of guy in their marketing department or in their marketing team that constantly tries out new marketing formats because there's a lot of cool stuff happening right now. I don't know how closely you follow that, but the abilities that you'll have on the Amazon platform, the abilities that you have on, on Pinterest, Pinterest will be incredibly cool as a marketing platform. And I think that is one thing, if you want to be competitive in this kind of landscape, I think one, one differentiator that you can do is always trying out every new platform that comes out. So what we try to have within our startups is one person that basically has the job to run two, three, four tests, whatever budget you want to spend on it, per month of new advertising formats that's out there. Because if more and more advertising budget is shifting to these large four platforms, if you want to differentiate yourself, the best way of doing it is being always on the new ones. So being the first one in the Ukraine that uses Pinterest, being the first one in the Ukraine that uses the new abilities within, uh, within whatever platform, within Twitter advertising. So because I can just give you a very plastic example. When, we st when, when Facebook mobile advertising started in Germany like two years ago, we were one of the few ones using it. And we were able to buy users for five, six months at a price way below they were actually worth. Yeah? So, and that's, that's the kind of thing, that's exactly going back to the financial services analogy that I had earlier. That's exactly how a Goldman Sachs behaves or Morgan Stanley behaves. They look at an, 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 uh, anomalies in the market and try to get uh, returns out of that. And I think that is what you need in digital marketing as well. You need somebody that constantly looks for an anomalies in the market and tries to get uh, some kind of financial return out of this. Another thing that's very hard to do, and but you need to have some kind of opinion on this. If you look at customer journey, and what I said earlier, one big problem is if you don't have the login really, it's very, very hard to detect whether it's a, a single customer or not. And I think one, one thing that we see in a lot of startups that they're not doing right, they're not thinking about enough, is trying to build an ad like a website and an app base as soon as, as, as possible. Because having a lot of apps out there and a larger base of apps is not only because you can reach existing customers, but it's also so that you're able to understand, at least with a certain share of users, um, the cross-channel or, or the cross-device interaction of certain users. And I think that is becoming more and more important. And most of the companies we look at uh, are not well positioned in that space. So, and again, another differentiator for um, for, to, to, become, to become better. So I think that's, that's key. Um, another very interesting phenomenon that, you, that you've seen during the last two years of digital advertising, if you look at the new content, content portals that have emerged over the last two, three years, like BuzzFeed, etc. If you look at content portals that started 2003, 2004, 2005, they're mainly getting their traffic still out of search and out of direct, out of direct type ins. And if you look at BuzzFeed, that's, I mean, at top of the curve, they basically replaced the same kind of, the same kind of traffic level, not coming from search, but actually coming systematically out of social. And that's another capability that you can build within an organization. And I'm not talking only about content models, but there's lots of startups, or not lots of them, but there's some startups that are actually able to generate similar traffic levels to SEO or SEA out of social networks in a systematic way, because that's something that is still a pretty much untapped kind of model outside the content model world. And I just urge you, that's another differentiator that you could potentially have if you move outside the, the, big, the, the big platforms. Another big challenge that I see 
And I think we had the media for equity discussion this morning. And uh, the lady from Berda and also the guy from, from Prozim the Alliance, they were both arguing, well, there's some kind of branding effect that you get from traditional media that digital cannot provide you with. And I would 100% agree. I mean, when we started Zalando within Rocket, definitely the Prozim that Ein's contract that, that Zalando had at the time contributed a pretty large chunk to the development of Zalando. I think there's no doubt about it. But I think the understanding of how branding translates into turnover, that's actually present or that's actually not present in a lot of organizations. And it's funny to see, even an organization like eBay, that's incredibly good when it comes to things like performance marketing, they have basically not a lot of ideas and not a clear model how branding advertising relates to their performance advertising and vice versa. And I think this understanding or having a superior understanding how branding advertising actually translates into performance and vice versa, that's a big USP. And that's actually, if you have a good understanding of how to do this, that's actually a reason for other companies to buy you. Yeah? Because as a startup, you always have to think about what are my prominent kind of things that I can bring to the table? Turnover, EBIT, whatever. And what we see, and I think that's a very attractive kind of development, more and more transactions in the space happen because of capabilities. Yeah? Startups are bought more and more by capabilities. That's something that's happening in the US for a long time. Yeah? That's the justification why people buy something like Oculus Rift for two point something billion. That's only because of capabilities. And understanding the relation between branding and performance in a better way, that's a capability that's worth quite a lot. So investing into that is not only good for your business, but makes you significantly more attractive. And I think, yeah, I'm I guess I have to stop because time's over. Is there any more questions to that? So there was just some helicopter view on digital advertising as I see it. Hopefully I wasn't too much removed from your what you know, normally do. Um, but I guess it's relevant to everybody that's active in that space. And I think getting this kind of perspective and always having this in mind when you run your operational day-to-day -day marketing stuff is kind of helpful to have at least some bigger vision or some bigger picture of where this whole digital ecosystem is heading. Because there's actually yeah, quite, qu quite a lot of change in it right now. Thanks a lot.